Hello, I'm Beck. Welcome to my channel. Today I'll be drawing a D&D character based on the roll of the dice. Let's bring out the Tower of Destiny! So we have a human and then a multi-class and I'll get into how I chose the multi-class in a second but you can see from my inspiration pictures that I wanted to go for a kind of punk rock and roll style person uh, because Bard and Warlock they lend themselves to something a little bit more fun and spicy so that's where we've got the inspiration picks here. A lot of them are poses, some of them are like I really like that crazy pink hair and I, I wanted to really play with intense colors in terms of like shadows and things so you'll see that a little bit later on in the video but let's get started. Now it shouldn't surprise anyone to know that uh, human in the D&D universe is not very dissimilar from humans in reality. Uh, obviously all of us playing are humans, or at least I hope so. And uh, the description of what a human can be is pretty much what humans are here. So they are a broad spectrum of people, ranging from very short to very tall, uh, lots of different skin tones, usually on the brown to pale peachy axis, so not a lot of greens and blues. And uh, there are a lot of ethnicities, which you don't really hear about this in the D&D universe when you're talking about races. I know in the New Player's Handbook they're talking, they've changed the word to species. But uh, yeah, within the human race of D&D, there are a lot of ethnicities. Uh, I, I don't think any of the other races in D&D have this, but obviously there was demand for it and it makes sense. So moving along, the traits you get as a human aren't particularly exciting until you look at the <laughs> sub, sub race things. So um, the standard traits you get before you choose a sub race are uh, your standard size is medium, speed is 30 feet, and you can read, write, and speak common. That's it. But the sub races are mark of various things and then variant human. And I've heard some exciting stuff about variant humans. Um, two different ability scores of your choice increase by one. You gain proficiency in one skill of your choice and you get to choose a feat. So apparently in the new player's handbook, all new um, characters will have a feat. I, more on that later, I don't really know any details in that area. Now with our multi-class, usually when I roll multi-class on the table, I would just roll the dice two more times to determine what their multi-class is. But I have since learned that uh, in order to multi-class, you need prerequisites in terms of what your ability score minimums can be. So this time I decided to look at what the ability score roles were and then see what was even possible and choose from that. So I put the table of prerequisites on the screen and you can see that um, the highest score we have is Charisma, so I wanted to choose two classes that had at least 13 Charisma. And I ended up going with, shockingly, Bard and Warlock. It's already on the screen, so it's not a big reveal there. But I read up a little bit on what a Bard Warlock could do. And um, one of the things that people are very excited about is you can learn uh, Eldritch Blast as Warlock and also obviously you have all your sort of Bard stuff. So uh, there is a bit of opinion out there that the best Bard multi-class there is is to be a Bard Warlock multi-class. 
um, because, yes, in addition to being able to cast Eldritch Blast, um, your spell slots recharge on a short rest. I don't know if that is normal. I haven't played as a bard or as a warlock, so I'm not going to get too much into the nitty gritty. But um, that's basically how I chose this multicast instead of rolling the dice. I wanted something that you could actually play with the scores that I rolled. And some of the scores are very low, so charisma is the best one, and this is a good charisma having chick whose name is Tessica. Tessica, that's her name. And she is a rock and roll chick because she has made a deal with a devil or um, what are they called? De de they're not called demons. Fiend is the word I'm thinking of because a warlock could have a patron that's an archfey or a fathomless, a fiend, a genie, or the great old one. Basically any otherworldly patron. And, um, usually they are a little bit more nefarious than the deities that a cleric might get their magic from through worship. So, uh, Tessica definitely has made a deal with a fiend to be the most awesome bard there ever was. Maybe the most famous, maybe um, the richest, the most popular, she, whatever the wording was would have to be very specific and the fiend would grant that in addition to magic that helps her to do whatever it is the fiend wants done in exchange because unlike the cleric and the paladin where the cleric gets their magic from a, a deity patron through faith and a paladin gets their magic through making an oath it's a powerful bond this one is very much just a contract you do something for me i'll do something for you but usually in the case of like working for a fiend uh what you have to do for them is much worse than um what they are granting you in terms of if it's an even trade although there it's possible to have a deal with a warlock where you're both very happy with the arrangement it's just a little bit more fun to play when uh, maybe you didn't read the fine print of your contract and you think it's for the rest of your life but it's actually for all eternity so she's a famous rock star while she's alive but what happens after she dies who knows now a bard of course isn't just a musician and in the new player handbook i keep mentioning a new player's handbook it's coming out very soon so i'm excited but uh a bard they're not just a ma musician they're ma their magic they have magic um their performances can change the audience they're sort of they do magic through a performance so it's not just a matter of being very good at playing an instrument um they make people not just feel things but sometimes do things or they have an effect on the area uh, it's a very cool magical class to play so looking at the ability scores which we've already discussed a little bit we've got the highest score being charisma with a plus two and the lowest score being strength and intelligence with a negative two so she's not particularly strong but and she's not particularly smart but she she's just average in wisdom i don't know that she necessarily had the best upbringing especially with a plus two constitution i think that's something where um she had to learn to just like tolerate any food that she could get her hands on um, with the negative two strength i don't think she had to physically fight her way out of anything but uh she's she definitely didn't come from an upper class situation and that kind of plays into why she might turn to like making a deal with a fiend to um, guarantee her fame rather than uh, if she was coming from some upper class situation she would probably already have like the connections and the ties that would almost guarantee her success so you sort of get that you, get, you see it in reality a lot, where someone who's coming from like a legacy of s superstar actors 
yes, they're very talented, but a lot of people are very talented, but never get their shot because they don't know anyone in the industry. Whereas like Goldie Hawn's daughter obviously has connections in the industry. So if she wants to be an actress, she's kind of guaranteed success in that area. It's, it happens. It happens. And it's not to say that they shouldn't get these opportunities, but it does mean that people who don't have that access to fame and fortune might need to turn to other avenues, especially if you're in a magical world where you know that's a, an option for you. And especially if, if you're doing something and there's a guarantee through magic that you'll succeed, why would you not do that? And I think this is the cl this is the case for Tessica. She has made this deal, and she's been this superstar pop star. And uh, I think probably she would be joining an adventuring party to um, tick the box of whatever it is this warlock wants from her, whether it's human souls <laughs> or whether it's something else entirely. Because I like the idea of even though. I keep, I keep saying Warlock instead of Fiend, the patron, whatever you get. She's the Warlock, the, the one that she owes stuff to is the patron. Anyway, um, <laughs> I like the idea of um, the, the devils and the fiends who kind of work in hell. Um, they're kind of just the other, the, mirror, the other side of the coin. To like angels and things like that where whether you're going to heaven or whether you're going to hell one is punishing people for doing the wrong thing and one is rewarding people for doing the right thing so really both of their missions is to have people do the right thing so I think in terms of Tessica the wall <laughs> the fiend <laughs> is trying to get her um, to sort of get people to, I guess, sin, to do the wrong thing. She's giving them the opportunity to do the wrong thing. And when they do, she's entitled to kill them, which then sends them into the hell dimension. And they go straight to this fiend or devil where he, ha he gets to claim that soul because they have committed a sin in response to what his, um, his warlock has done. So she's basically tempting people to do the wrong thing. And especially in the context of traveling around with an adventuring party where they, they're a bunch of heroes who are fighting evil. It's a great opportunity to be like, hey, you're fighting evil. I need to find evil. And if I'm the one who kills this evil person, then that helps me to fulfill my contract. And P.S. You get to travel around with a superstar, which means you get access to places that you wouldn't otherwise be granted access to. Because we all know that when you have a certain celebrity with you, yes, it's harder to um, go around unnoticed and unless she, and a bard can usually do pretty good disguises and hide. So um, they're not hiding in the way that a rogue would, but they hide in plain sight as like in costume, in disguise. So when she doesn't want to be noticed, that's what she does. But otherwise, she could be going to like visit kings and queens and they would just let, they would escort her in because she's so famous that this royalty wants to meet her. They want to get their photo with her because everybody loves her because she's a famous pop star. And so I think it would be really fun to have a character like this in your adventuring party. Um, and yeah, she just wants the killing blow and she maybe also in her spare time goes into the odd tavern and gets like a low key jerk to cross a line that then results in him also being killed and sent to the underworld to deal with hell. <laughs> uh, it's a little bit dark, but I think we all love the like karmic Giving, giving people calm off being, being jerks. Everyone loves that. Everyone wants to play a person who's like, hey, guess what? Here's your karma because I'm not waiting for it to show up. Uh, but yeah, what do we all think of Tessica? I really like how the lighting turned out on this one. I want to do more crazy lighting like that in future. Um, but thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this and I'll catch you next time.
Okay, bye.